this section, I would like to talk about solving proportions. First, we want to define what a proportion is. If you'll notice in the blue box, it says the fraction A over B is equal to C over D. And there's a couple things that have to be true if this is the case. B cannot be equal to zero. Remember, you never are allowed to have a denominator equal to zero, nor can D be equal to zero. And the way you can read this is A is to B, as C is to D. And when you're breaking this down into word problems, that's the way you're going to think about it. So A and B are related in a certain way, and C and D are related in the same way. So let's try a problem. So we, it says if we have two cups of sugar that makes 24 cookies. So we can say these two things go together. How much sugar is needed to make 60 cookies? So these two things go together. So 2 is to 24. So 2 cups of sugar is to 24 cookies as, okay, so A is to B as C is to D. So how much sugar? Now we don't know, so I'm going to say X cups of sugar goes with 60 cookies. Okay, now when we solve this proportion, we do not have to have the units in the fraction. So we really could write this as 2 over 24 is equal to x over 60. What I want to make sure you realize is if cups of sugar or some particular unit is in the numerator, it must be the same unit in the other numerator. Notice cookies is in the denominator, so on the right fraction, cookies must all also be in the denominator. Now to solve our proportion, what you need to do is, we kind of call this cross multiply. I multiply 2 times 60, so I can say 2 times 60 is equal to, I cross this way, 24 times x. And then you simply just solve for x. So we know 2 times 60 is 120 is equal to 24x. My next step to solve for x would be divide both sides by 24. And then we calculate 120 divided by 24, and that's going to be the cups of sugar. So that gives me 5 when I divide 120 divided by 24 and equals x. Or I could say the answer to this is 5 cups of sugar. Okay, so real world example of math right there, making cookies. So on part B, it simply just says to solve the proportion. So the hard part, setting up the proportion, is done. I need to cross this way and multiply, so I have 24x is equal to, on the other side, 5 times 36 when I cross this way. Now I just need to do the calculation, so 5 times 36 gives me 180 on the right side. And then this problem just happens to be dividing by 24 as well. So I get x is equal to 180 divided by 24 gives me 7.5. So you will not always have a nice whole number. Okay, the five cups of sugar worked out nicely, but you won't always have a nice whole number. And also, please pay attention to the fact of is it okay that I type in a decimal as an answer? Is it okay to have a decimal as an answer? Or should I put it in a fraction in lowest terms? Um, I went ahead and divided and got a decimal, but we could reduce 180 over 24, um, probably by dividing by 12, I think goes into both of those. So 180 divided by 12 is going to give me 15. Okay, and then 24 divided by 12 we know is 2. So 15 halves would be the appropriate fraction answer, whereas 7 and 5 tenths or 7.5 would be okay as a decimal answer. All right, so on this page I have a couple of proportions to solve. No word problem here, just cross multiply. So A times 3, I'm going to write it as 3A. Now on the other side, 4 times a minus 5. Now watch this. If I write 4a minus 5, I'm going to tell you that's wrong. Okay? I multiplied 4 times the entire difference of a minus 5. So parentheses are your friends here. So I have 3a is equal to, now I use the distributive property, that's 4a minus 20. Now the goal is to solve for a. So what I'm going to do, since I already have a constant on the right-hand side, let's subtract our 4a 
and get it on the left hand side of this equation. So now I have negative 1a is equal to negative 20. To solve for a, I'm going to divide both sides by negative 1. And so a is equal to 20. How could I check it? You can check every one of these. I won't in the video, but let me show you. Take that 20 and plug it back in. So is 20 divided by 20 minus 5, is that really equal to 4 thirds? All right, well, that's going to be 20 over 15. And 20 over 15 reduces by 5, and it does give us 4 thirds. So this checks out. So checking these is a breeze. Just plug it right back in. All right, let's try another problem. All right, so I've got cross here, 15 times 2x plus 15, and that's equal to, I cross the other way, 9 times 7x plus 3. Again, note the parentheses. I, if I don't put parentheses there, it only looks like I'm multiplying the 15 times the 2x, which is incorrect. I multiply 15 times the entire numerator, which means I'm using the distributive property. So now I have 30x plus, and then 15 times 15 gives me 225. And on the other side, 9 times 7x is 63x plus 63. And now I subtract, well, I have a choice, right? Um, I have variable and constant on both sides of the equation. A lot of people prefer the variables on the left. In that case, I would subtract 63x on both sides. And then there's the other group of people that prefer their variables being positive. And that would be not be subtracting 63 on both sides. But in this case, I get negative 33x plus 225 is equal to 63. And then I subtract 225 from both sides of the equation. Remember, you're doing this everything once on each side of the equation. That gives me negative 33x is equal to, and then 63 subtract 225 gives me negative 162. I divide both sides by negative 33. And one thing I do know is that a negative divided by a negative is going to be a positive. Now, what I don't know right off the bat is if 66, 162 divided by 33. It doesn't a whole number of times. Um, I do know that they both divide by 3. So I'm going to reduce this fraction to lowest terms. Again, the answer is positive because these negatives cancel. 162 divided by 3 is 54, and we know 33 divided by 3 is 11. So that is lowest terms. Um, if we write this as a decimal, I think you might notice that you would need to round because the decimal goes on and on. So in this case, a fraction is a much better answer than a decimal because you don't want to round unless it says that it's okay to round. But never just round on your own without... Um, direction saying round to a certain decimal place. So now we're back to word problems. Pediatricians prescribe 5 milliliters of acetaminophen for every 25 pounds of a child's weight. All right, so, so you're trying to read the proportion out of this, right? How many milliliters of acetaminophen would the doctor prescribe for Abby who weighs 45 pounds? So again, if I highlight here, we know that 5 millimeters goes with 25 pounds. And on the other hand, we know that we don't know how many milliliters goes with 45 pounds. So we have a fraction right there. That's our two separate fractions. The yellow fraction says 5 milliliters goes with 25 pounds. Now the next fraction, we better have milliliters on top and pounds on the bottom, just like we did here. So just to remind us, milliliters, and this was pounds. So how many milliliters? We don't know. Let's call it X, but we know the pounds is 45. Again, milliliters over pounds, milliliters over pounds. Now it's time to cross multiply. 5 times 45 is equal to the other way, 25 times X. Now, in our calculators, we can calculate 5 times 45, and I get 225 is equal to 25x. Next step, divide both sides by 25 to get the x isolated. And 225 divided by 25 gives me 9. 9 what? 9 milliliters of acetaminophen. I'm just going to abbreviate acetaminophen. Okay.
Let's keep going. Maybe pause this one and try to work it out on your own. At a fast food restaurant, 22 ounces of chocolate shake has 850 calories. Okay, those two items go together. 22 ounces of chocolate shake has 850 calories. Then the problem goes on to ask you a question about that relationship. If that's true, then how many calories are in a 12 ounce chocolate shake? So once again, I have my fractions as two different colors here. So I know that 22 ounces goes with 850 calories. So when I set up my next fraction, I must have ounces in the numerator and calories in the denominator. So how many calories, we don't know. So this time I have an X in the denominator. Goes with 12 ounces of chocolate shake, so 12 ounces goes in the numerator. And once again, we can ignore our units because they are all the same units and cross multiply. So I have 22X is equal to the other side. That's going to be 12 times 850. Then I'll just type that in my calculator. So 12 times 850 is equal to 10,200. And I have 22X on the left. Now my next step is to isolate the X by dividing both sides by 22. So 10,200 divided by 22 gives me 463.63 repeating. Okay, now the fact is, ah, oh, there it is, round your answer to the nearest whole number. So that would be 464 calories. Okay. Carly loves Hershey Kisses chocolate candies, but wants to keep her snacks to 100 calories. If the candies have 260 calories for 10 pieces, how many pieces can she have in her snack? So again, I encourage you to pause it, see if you can't set up this proportion, and then come back and see if you did it right. So let's set up what we know. I know that, let's see, if candies have 260 calories for 10 pieces, those go together. And then what I'm trying to discover is how many pieces can she have in her snack. But what's the calories that go with that? 100 calories. Okay, so in blue is one fraction and in yellow is the other. So um, again, 260 goes with 10 pieces. Now, how do you decide what goes on top? How do you decide what number goes in the top? Does calories go on top or does pieces go on top? Actually, it doesn't matter. So I'm going to put 200, not that big. I'm not, just a second, folks. How about 260? Um, calories goes with 10 pieces. Now here's what, you know, it doesn't matter which one goes on top, but it does now. So whatever I do to the left dictates what I do to the right. So calories must be on top. That's 100. And how many pieces? That goes in the denominator. We don't know. So now it's time to cross multiply. 260x is equal to, when I cross this way, 100 times 10. So I have 260x is equal to 100 times 10, which is 1,000. And then I divide both sides by 260. So x is equal to 1,000 divided by 260. So x is equal to, now I've got 1,000 divided by 260. Now when you type that in your calculator, you get 3.846 and it just keeps going and going and going. Then you think, uh-oh, it doesn't say anything about rounding. But let's read the problem. What do we just find, find out? It says, how many pieces can she have in her snack? Now, you can't have 3.8 Hershey Kisses. I guess you can work on trying to cut the thing down and get 3.8. So the question is, do we round this up to 4? Is it 4 Hershey Kisses? Or do we round it down to 3 Hershey Kisses? Okay, now let's think about what we're trying to do. She says she wants to keep her snacks to 100 calories. Now, if she rounds up to four Hershey Kisses, it's going to be over 100 calories, right? So she would have to round down, in this case, to only have three Hershey Kisses if she wants to keep it below 100. Now, if she ate four, it would be just a little over 100, and you could always calculate that. But fact is, if we're trying to meet her needs, she can have three Hershey Kisses for her snack.
All right, let's try another problem. Clyde and Buford are traveling to Japan and need to exchange $500 into Japanese yen. It says if each dollar is 93.2 yen, how many yen will they get? So we've got all kinds of information here. We've got $500. We've got each dollar is 93.2 yen. And the question is, how many yen will they get? Well, no, this is your comparison right here. The one we've been highlighting yellow all along are if each dollar is 93.2 yen. That's our first fraction. One dollar is 93.2 yen. So I'm going to write that as a fraction. So again, one dollar is 93.2 yen. And remember, this is in dollars. Now when I come to my other fraction, I need to have dollars in the numerator and yens in the denominator. Now the question is, if we have $500, or if Clyde and Buford do, then that's going to go in the dollars spot, and we don't know how many yen that's going to be, so we're going to call this x. Then when you multiply across, you have 1x is equal to 500 times 93.2. And 1x is just x, of course, and I'm going to type in 500 times 93.2, and that's going to give me 46,000. 600 yen. So $500 turns into a whole bunch of yen, doesn't it? For our next problem, looks like a ge geometry problem, we've got a triangle ABC, so that's our big blue triangle here, is similar to our smaller triangle in green XYZ. Okay, similar triangles have exactly the same shape. In other words, all the angles are the same. What's different is their th side lengths are the same. But if all the angles are the same, that means their side lengths are proportional. Okay, so they want us to find side X. Well, we've got to find side X. There it is, right there. And we're supposed to find the value of that. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to your blue triangle and pull down two sides that you know, okay, and it has to correspond to side x over here. So 12 goes with 8, right, and 9 goes with x. So when I set up my proportion, we can say 12 is to 9 as 8 is to x. You see that? So again, 12 and 8 were in the same position. Okay, notice they're in the same position in our fraction, too. And 9 and x are in the same position, also in the same position in our fraction. So again, because these are similar triangles, we can say 12 is to 9 as 8 is to x. And now we just cross multiply. So 12 times x, of course, is 12x. And 8 times 9 is 72. I divide both sides by 12. And we know that x equals 72 divided by 12 is 6. And so our answer is 6. Now, normally we have a unit, but 12 and 9 and 8, we had no units. This could be 6 miles. It could be 6 inches. It could be 6 centimeters. We don't know, but it's 6. Okay, so the length of side x is 6. All right, so we're approaching the end of our problems. We've got two to go. Notice we have a map here. It says on the map, Seattle, notice this at the top, Portland on the left, and Boise on the right near the bottom form a triangle whose sides are shown in the figure below. It says if the actual distance from Seattle to Boise is 400 miles. So from Seattle to Boise is 400 miles. Find the distance from Seattle to Portland. Okay, so we're trying to find this distance right here. Now on a map, a, a map should be proportional to the real distances. It's, they're not always, be careful, but a good map should be proportional to the real distances. So what we can do is we can compare our map distances to our real distances, okay? So we can say 4 inches to 1.5 inches. So again, I'm using this one because that's that's the distance we know compared to this one which is the distance that we're looking for between Seattle and Portland. That's the same as, well, 4 inches in real distance is 400 miles, and that goes with 
we don't know the x distance or question mark up there from seattle to portland okay now the inches units we can just leave alone and we can cross multiply 4 times x is 4x times 1.5 times 400 and if you multiply 1.5 times 400 in your calculator you should get 600 i'm going to do it anyway just to make myself feel better and we do, okay, then divide both sides by 4, so x is equal to 600 divided by 4, and that gives me a value of 150. Now again, always look for units on these, the last problem didn't have units, but they usually have units. 150 what? Well, we're looking at miles, right? Since the original distance was 400 miles between Seattle and Boise, then we're talking about miles is what's on the bottom down here, okay? Now our last problem, a light pole is 7 feet tall and casts a 12 foot shadow. Notice there are no pictures here, so maybe we should draw a picture. So we have a light pole, not fancy, so it shoots out some light, okay. Light pole is 7 feet tall, so this is 7 feet, and it casts a 12 foot shadow. So there's the shadow of our light pole. Again, light shining here, all right. And you can think about that as a triangle if you want to. That would be called the hypotenuse. It says the shadow of a nearby tree is 30 feet. So we've got some tree over here. And it also has a shadow. And it tells us this shadow is 30 feet. Okay. The question is, is how tall is the tree? That also makes a triangle. These are similar triangles because that's the way the sun works, okay? So the sun is back over here, shining light, and the shadows are going to be exactly the same angle, okay? So we really have two separate triangles, and we're looking for this distance right here, okay? So here's what I can do. I can say 7 is to 12, so height is to shadow, so this is height compared to shadow, if you like is equivalent to, once again, height, we don't know, question mark, is to shadow is 30. So I'm going to cross multiply. 7 times 30 is equal to 12 times x. And we know 7 times 30 is 210 is equal to 12x. Divide both sides by 12. So I've got 210 divided by 12. And that's going to tell me x is equal to... I've got 17.5. Now again, the question is, are there any units here? Well, this was all in terms of feet, right? So this must be in feet as well. So the height of our tree is 17.5 feet. And with the same um, angle, okay, of the sun, we would get a 30-foot shadow for 17.5-foot tree. I hope this helps.